in uh, May of 2019 and we completely, we almost gutted the place. Um, we took down wallpaper. We did a ton of work, which I can, you know, discuss as we're going through the tour. That's great. And so did you do this as a flip or were you planning to stay here long term? No, we actually did it. Um, so it was on three acres of land and we've subdivided it into three one acre lots. And we are actually building a house in the backyard. Um, and so I can show you that as well. Um, we tried to, you know, work with the land in the town as best we could to make it all kind of fit and look like it belongs. Um, sorry, I've got people in the house, so they were being loud. <laughs> so that's why I'm outside. My mom's working from my house today because she had no internet. So that's, oh. you know, something. Um, so yeah, so we now have three one acre lots up here and we're building in the back. So this was the intention all along. Okay. So the plan is going to be to build a new home to move into. And are you going to stay in this home until you sell the new home? Is that the goal? Yeah. So the timeline I mean, until, you, until the new home's ready for occupancy. I'm sorry. Sorry. So the house out back is almost done. So the timeline is I'm actually taking pictures on Thursday of the farmhouse that we're in. Um, and then we're going to probably move in like maybe two or three weeks. We're just wrapping everything up. We've got to get a certificate of occupancy. So it kind of depends on, you know, everybody doing what they're supposed to do, which has not been happening very well this this go around. Um, and then as soon as we're in, I mean, we will list the house empty um, by the time we, by the time we're able to list it, because one other caveat is that we need to take down a piece of um, a piece of our barn, which is really old and falling down anyway. Um, so we're taking that down. So I'm not listing it obviously until that, that portion comes down um, because we need it for the frontage for the second lot out back. Okay, understood. And um, so will you be staging the house when we put it on the market? Can um, I interrupt you for one I second, will... Jessica? Do you see how I, I just made that assumptive close right there? And I, I, I made it seem like I will be the listing agent of this property, right? So I said to her, will you be staging the house when we put it on the market? That assumes that she's already decided to list with me. Subconsciously <laughs> putting it in her brain that that's what's happening. It's called an assumptive close, right? So I'll do that throughout the process. And the reason that I'm having this conversation with Jessica is because we're going to try to show you what a listing presentation looks like. Is that okay with you, Jessica, if we just keep playing that game? Sounds great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So it, let's go back to that then. Um, so okay. Jessica, will you be staging the house will, when we list it? Um, you know, there'll be some of our stuff still here, I'm sure. Uh, I wasn't planning on a full staging. I mean, obviously the pictures will have all of our furniture. So, you know, I know that's huge to get the buyers in. Um, I'll kind of, I'll play it by ear. <laughs> Where are we, if you have recommendations, sure. <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, I don't know if you had a chance to... Did you have a chance to read through the pre-listing package that I sent you? This is a reminder. I really didn't, I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. I just wanted to let this you know that one of the things that we do offer here at the Scotland team is we will bring a stager in and they will tell us what the most important rooms are to stage and how to do that. Um, would that be something that would you'd find helpful? Absolutely. Okay. So we can do that. And then we can decide if you have extra furniture that you can leave in those rooms or, you know, we just want to make sure that um, people can visualize their things in the home. Sometimes you have to have furnishings there in order to be able to do that. We won't definitely won't need to furnish every single room. Would that sound like a good plan? Sounds good. Okay. So um, why don't you give us a tour of the outside and then we'll go inside. Is that all right? Yep. So I'm going to turn my 
screen around. How do I do that? There you go. All right, so I'm going back outside. Okay. All right. Oh, I love that yellow barn over there. Oh yeah, that used to belong with this house actually. Um, and then it got sold off. So hold on, let me just wait for the traffic. <laughs> Yeah, don't get yourself hit. <laughs> right, and here's my mom leaving. So that's the house um, built in 1784. And then the barn goes all the way over. Um, and we're going to be, um, I'll go back up. Kind of snowy for me to trudge around outside, but I can show you the backyard after too. Okay. Um, so we're going to, there is a small garage, um, but it's really small. It like it could probably fit a Honda Fit. It's not very deep at all. I I can't put you know my Forerunner in there. Good so storage, the barn, though, right? What it is storage. Yep. Yeah. So the barn is going to go off like basically right where that my kid's scarecrow from school um, <laughs> is mm -hmm. is standing. Okay. So it'll stay, but this whole portion. But again, I mean, there's a ratchet strap holding up a piece of this. Uh, inside that part so I don't really feel bad you know taking it down and okay. it's one less thing for a buyer to say oh what's going on here so sure yeah so tell me now there'll be landscaping a driveway what will be there where that building is that's coming down um I mean at this point we'll just grass it um you know may and probably just grass it that's it um there is a driveway on this side that goes to the back um, at this point that we've been using partially for construction. Um, so, I mean, obviously we're, I mean, I'm fine waiting till the spring because I want to, I, I guess I can walk up here. Um, we're losing you a little bit, Jess. Inviting you. There's the back there. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a mess. So, and then with the mud, mud season is, uh, oh, I probably am away from my Wi-Fi. Yeah. Okay. So that gives us a good idea of what the outside looks like. But, um, but that new house that's out back, that, that's going to be ours, the driveway runs up down there on the far side of the lot. Okay, so is that little tree over there in on your land or the new house's land? That tree is still on this property. The little one, the further one, yeah, is on the the, the new property. It's about so see where the um the mailbox is right there. The the can you see that that mailbox? Yes. Right there. Um there's a driveway right there. We've got about 80 feet from the other side of the driveway. Okay. this way so that's the new lot okay so how much land do you have on your side lot do you roughly oh i don't i don't know i'd have to look at the i can and that's the thing too i'm going to um have our engineer uh redraw everything once the barn comes down and make it just sort of like this is this property so okay. and not show anybody oh this was the barn that used to be here none of that so i mean i've yeah, that's, that's why it'll take us a little longer because of the weather and it's just not been, you know, so. No, that's very smart. I think that um, it'll be much easier to market your property once it's all in place the way it's right. supposed to be. Right. And you won't have people saying, oh, I would have loved to have bought it with the big extension on the barn. Right. But we also don't want to point out to a buyer like, sure there is another lot there and you know I, i'm not gonna lie obviously our intention is to build if somebody outright asks me i'm going to tell them but um we're not gonna like advertise because i mean things change i mean we might there is no building there like we might sell the land if, if we came on hard times i have no idea i can't guarantee you know what we're doing so if there is a buildable lot there that you've already um defined Mm -hmm. you should probably at least give a plot plan and yep. show what that looks like 
yeah, I can, I can appreciate that. But again, it's just that we'd attach it to the listing. Yep. And I mean, we even have a whole plan of, you know, the three separate lots. So, I mean, uh, again, certainly not lying about anything, but uh, it's our intention to build on that second lot, but I don't know. That's a couple of years from now. Who knows? Lots can happen. Right. Well, people will ask. Yep. I'm sure they will. Lot plan there. And are you going to be filling out a property condition statement, Jessica? Yeah. So you'll probably put it on there as well, correct? Yep. 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 Okay. So that'll work. Okay. So we're inside now. Why don't you give us a tour of the inside? Okay. So um, we all, we use the side door, obviously, because uh, that's where the driveway is. And you come in. Um, so this was all... Alejandra, can you take Teddy out? Because I'm giving a <laughs> sorry. <laughs> my dog always needs to go, right? Right when, um, so my son is home from school and we've got the sitter here helping. So um, so we redid the whole kitchen. Um, they're all original floors. This is one of four fireplaces. Uh, there's fresh paint through the entire house. Um, all new windows. We, they were all like the original wavy glass. Sorry, I started collecting boxes for the new house with That's mirrors okay. and light fixtures coming. We can um, see that. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so that's the door to get out back, which I can show you after. Let me turn some lights on. Um, the pantry is kind of a disaster, but it is kind of nice to have great pantry. Nice pantry. Um, we left some of the old touches like left the linoleum and the beautiful wallpaper in here. Um, off the kitchen, there's a small half bath um, that we redid. We took flooring from the attic and we finished it to match wow. the rest. So that got freshened up. Um, so the kitchen, obviously, I mean, it's just a pretty basic farmhouse with a butcher block island. Um, so yeah, so that's the kitchen. Um, this is the living room right off the kitchen. So we have, it's really nice too. There's nine foot ceilings, um, all the, the beams up top, which is really, really nice. Um, so living room, second fireplace, um, back in the kitchen, uh, down here, this was actually, it's my office. Okay. but it was actually the birthing room, you know, 1784. So oh, wow. uh, right off the kitchen. Yep. So who knows what went on in here, but right now I just work. <laughs> That's history. Um, no birthing going yeah, on there now. <laughs> yeah, no birthing. No, uh, dining room. Sorry. Again, like started packing and I'm getting ready for pictures, obviously. So I've thinned some stuff out pretty extensively. Um, again, all new windows, all new paint. Uh, the third fireplace. Pretty. Um, pretty. So and that's the, that's pretty much the first floor. Really nice original staircase that we just painted and put a runner on. Oh, I love that banister. Yeah, it's it's in great shape too. It's yeah. like really great shape. Here's my dogs coming with us. So upstairs, here's where we did the most of the renovation. I mean, everything you see here had wallpaper on it. So I mean, we that was a lot of work. Um, but up here, uh, well, this room, this is my kids share a room because then we have a playroom. Um, and they get the fireplace in their bedroom, <laughs> the fourth uh -huh. fireplace, but there's no closet in here. So it is a really generously sized room, but no closet. So that's, you know, a challenge. So in an old farmhouse, the closets that are, that are here, that were here, they don't do much. Um, like that, that's it. Little in shallow room, you know? closets. That's very yeah. typical of the age. Exactly, exactly. So it's not really all that useful. So yeah, so I made this into the kids' toy room and because it, it's a fairly small bedroom. Um, so it, that worked out well. Um, this used to be a small bedroom and we made it into a bathroom, a second, because there was only one bathroom up here and it was kind of 
funky uh, the way it was laid out. It's kind of hard to describe, um, but there were a couple doors in this bedroom, so it wasn't super functional. Uh, so we made this into uh, a bathroom for the kids. And then this room is now the laundry. Um, it was a wide open room. This wall right here was not here. Um, so we split it down the middle, made the laundry upstairs. That's a great um, the and we, Yeah, and we made this into a full master suite. So there's a couple doors to get in, one tiny closet existed. Um, and we added a closet wow. with a full master bathroom. So that is the other side. The laundry is on the other side of this and we blew through this wall right here. Nice. So that's why it's pretty wide. And then our only option was that barn door. Mm -hmm. um, and then we made a full walk through walk-in closet, which has a ton of storage, which is not very common in this age. Right. And then we made a full master bath with a closet um, and a big walk-in shower because my husband is a plumber. So kind of have to have nice bathrooms. Yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so that was, you know, we saw that vision when we looked at this house. Um, <laughs> Our, <laughs> I'm bringing you upstairs. We have um, a, a live-in childcare right now. And she's like, my room is not organized. So just bear <laughs> with her. <laughs> no judging. No judging um, so here. This, this room was not, um, she's getting ready for pictures though. She does know that. Um, was not heated up here. So we actually um, tore down all the walls. Uh, Insul foam insulation throughout the whole thing and made a full bedroom up here since we had gotten rid of that tiny bedroom that we made into a bathroom. So this bedroom, um, you know, would be great for like a teenager to kind of have their own space. Uh, we thought about putting a bathroom up here, but we never got around to it. And then full attic storage that we did, you know, all the foam insulation. So, and this room, great. Is, um, we did all new heating and air conditioning throughout. So this is all the, the AC work. and heat and duct work for the second floor. And then we did all the AC and duct work for the first floor in the basement. Teddy, come That's on. That's awesome. So do you have gas or is it oil or what do you it's have? Oil. It's oil and, um, hold on. And then this room is actually managed by the mini split because, yep. because, and so, I'll take you outside in a minute. Teddy, come on. Nice, because if you're not using that, you can shut it down. Yeah, so they're both, they're all the um, hybrid mini splits and hybrid um, heat pumps. Teddy, come on. Um, so they're electric and they are, you know, supposed to be fairly efficient. We do use some of the oil in the, um, in the winter because the electric can get a little bit more expensive, but the oil works out really well. Um, for just a few months of the like really cold months. But to have the, you know, lower heating and to have cooling in a house like this is huge. Yeah, so, that's great. What a great um, job you've done. This is How many a mini mess units do you as well, have? but this is our, we call it our, the what? How many mini, is that, how many, do you have other mini split units in the house or is that the only one? That's the only mini split. Um, it's a heat pump system um, on the outside for, like we have, so it defaults to the electric heating, but then with the high efficient Mitsubishi heat pumps, but it has an override and we have a, I'll show you the basement in a minute too. Um, we have a full uh, brand new boiler down there that my husband installed again. Yeah, plumber. Perfect. Yeah, I was just curious. Gotta do all the things, right? <laughs> I know some homes are being completely heated by mini split systems now. Some people are having multiple right. mini splits put in. So yeah, that's I just wanted true. to see if that was the only one. The only challenge with just so, um, having that only is um, basements freeze sometimes in our area anyway. Yeah. So that you've got the backup system is perfect. Yep.
it's huge. It's huge. And it really doesn't cost us, you know, that much more to do. So it was, a, it was a good decision. Yep. Trying to switch my camera again. So mm -hmm. um, what's called the summer kitchen. Um, so it's kind of a disaster right now, but you know, it's got our extra fridges and then um, it's got this cute little, like it was a sitting area, but now it's full of boxes um, and <laughs> old sink that doesn't really work, but I'll stage this as well uh, to, you know, kind of it's it kind of can be like a little bit of a three season porch mm -hmm. um so and then the the garage that again part of it will get come off but I mean it's just it's really narrow but it's it's good for storage and then that's the barn I'm not even going to show you because nobody can have it so <laughs> um and then outside um you know we added this patio because it it doesn't look very hilly. It's actually fairly flat, but it just kind of slopes just enough that it wasn't super functional. Um, so, you know, I've got some stuff, obviously a lot of this will get dragged backyard. Um, but Jessica, we um, can't hear you again. You know, it's the way the neighborhood is kind of set. Sorry, I'm too far from the Wi-Fi. Yep. Too far from the Wi-Fi, sorry. That's okay. Um, take you down into the basement quickly. Cool, buddy. So Jessica, while we're walking down to the basement, give us an idea of what is most special about your home and your community and why do you love it so much? Um, so, I mean, the home, it, it's certainly a labor of love. Um, even though, you know, we knew we were only gonna be here for a few years because we had that plan all along to, to build out back. Um, I've not lived in an antique, especially an antique this old. Um, you know, to really modernize it and give us that like master suite and everything's updated. And it was so fun to be able to do like, I have different trim colors throughout. I kind of like, I, I just had a lot of fun with it because you could do something so different. Um, and like a true farmhouse, like I'm kind of, you know, over farmhouse. Yeah. I'm kind of <laughs> overall the like modern farmhouses. It's getting a little bit too much lately and so it was it was fun because I'm like I can get away with this really because this is you know what the house was um the community I mean I grew up in Lemonster I didn't really expect that we'd be back but this opportunity came up and we just were like wow this we were supposed to buy and build um on a different piece of land and we were living in temporary housing we had sold our previous build because this is actually our fourth build um, we've moved a lot so this is kind of one of our things that we do um, it's another way for us to make money because you know my husband has a small business I have a small business we have small kids it's just like we don't want to ever put all of our eggs in one basket so this has actually been a really um, profitable way for us to kind of do some of our more fun projects and adventures rather than just like relying on you know all the other stuff and tracking down money from plumbing clients because you know that can be fun um so i grew up in lemonster and you know i'm only a mile from my mom which worked out really well i never expected that but it's you know it's been really it's been really good so i'm happy that we made this move and um i'm very excited though to move into a new place with more storage because with kids it's just it's too much to climb so we've lost the screen. There we yeah, go. No, okay. Yeah, I was getting a call. So, um, so who do you think the buyer is for this home? Uh, well, lately, I mean, people are so desperate for houses. Who knows? Um, you know, I know that antiques are, you know, a really specific buyer. You have to be okay with crooked floors and, you know, not level anything and all of that. But, you know, to find an antique this updated uh, with so much done to it. I, I mean, I'm really, I'm really hoping that, you know, someone can really appreciate everything we've done. Um, there were, so full disclosure, this was a listing through my team a few years ago 
And I didn't get any special treatment by any means because we came in with a really strong cash offer. So, I mean, he got our offer and he was just like, I don't even want to look at anything else. This is the one I want. I don't care who it is like cash with no contingencies. Yeah. Sign me up. So, um, you know, we obviously put all of our efforts into getting it so we can make this happen. So there were, but I, I did run some of the open houses at this property and there was a lot of interest. I don't know how many offers they originally got. Um, but there was a lot of people at the open houses and it was really popular. So even in its previous state where you can go and look on Zillow right now and see all of the wallpaper and all of the, all of the stuff. So, um, we did a lot and I'm hoping someone will appreciate all of that and give us a good amount of money for it. Uh, so I'm in the basement. Um, obviously we did i mean it's not the, the scariest of basements. Good high ceilinged basement for yeah, being such a house it's not too bad i mean it does have the trench because i mean it's old obviously we get water you it, i'm not gonna be able to like hide that fact because we have a trench all around and right now and in the spring certainly there's some water coming in from the fieldstone foundation does the um, trench take care of the water it does we've never gotten water anywhere up above any of that so okay but so yeah is there um, a sump pump too there is not okay there is so where does the water go i don't know i'll have to ask my husband <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah. well, i was just curious yep um so this is the newer heating system a couple years old obviously you can't really use the basement anymore because it's got all the fireplaces uh, the ductwork i mean i was looking at the fireplace um the newer the system for the heating and cooling um my husband replaced the um oh we did an all new panel he put in a new oil tank uh we redid the well we also have so we have funny let me tell you two stories so obviously two hot water tanks because we can't ever run out of hot water Course. Are those superstore tanks? They're Bradford White. I don't know. They're heat. I I don't know. I, I, my husband will help me fill out that part. Don't okay. worry. Yep. Um, we did new well tanks. Um, so it is a, a septic and a well up here on this part of Lemonster. Um, and there we've got to do. We had to do one thing. So. Um, there's actually two wells here. There is a regular well for all the drinking water. And when we did last spring, when we were um, doing our quarantine gardens with our kids, uh, we were watering them outside and we were, um, you know, struggling to keep up with the water because, you know, we're trying to get these, these gardens to grow. And so we, the funny story, the, the people, guy that used to live here, drove by and he was like hey how's it going I want to check out what you guys did you know like just old man coming by wants to see his house whatever fine um and it was actually the son his son lived here and sold it to us so he had sold it to his son his son sold it to us but the old man wanted to come and see what we did and so we're walking through and he was like so out in the summer kitchen there's this big table in the middle that we were like we're gonna get rid of this and fill it in like it's so stupid it's just in the way um but the guy came and he was like, yeah, there's a well under there. And we're like, what? It's like, you know, it's a pretty shallow well, but so we actually changed the outside faucets to draw from that instead, instead That's of taking excellent. it. From, so, you know, you learn a little bit every day. Yeah. When, this, when the previous owner, because he just randomly showed up and showed us that. So, so yeah, so that's, um, that's about the bulk of it. All right. Okay. So let me tell you what my plan is and see how you um, feel about that. What I would like to do is take all this information, this great information that you gave us back to our office and do some research and then come back out here and sit down and chat with you about what we think for a value. In the meantime, do you have any idea what you think the value is? That's a loaded question. That's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I just would like to know what you are hoping to be able to walk away with 
Sure. Yeah. So um, I will say that we had it appraised in late 2019 because uh, we did a cash out refi to uh, start the build out back. That's how we, you know, bought it cash, did all the renovations. And then once we were done, we had it appraised so that we could take the money to start the build in the backyard. Um, and it appraised for four fifty. dollars um, So I know, you know, it's still an antique. It's still got its quirks. It's, you know, I, we would be thrilled if we walked away somewhere in that range. That's okay. about what the property. So we're not looking to like walk away with bank here. We're, you know, the whole point of this was to get the land in the back and, and have that, you know, project. Um, and the value comes from that for us. So really we're just looking to not lose a ton on the whole, this particular part of the project. Sure, absolutely. Well, well that's I where I appreciate you sharing that with me. Um, is there anything else I should know before we go and start our homework? I don't think so. Um, you know, it's just, it, it's just a challenge with the antique. So I've been watching like, sterling for antiques because we're right on the sterling line i think that that is there was a antique in sterling that was on the market for 450 so that kind of gave me some hope mm -hmm. so um but not much else um i've kind of given you the bulk of everything okay um so what we would like to do is we like to have a couple of days normally by the way guys i would try to get back there the same day or the next day when Jessica and her husband, is it just the two of you on your deed? Yes. Okay. So what I, my goal is if I'm going to do a two visit meeting with them is I don't mind meeting with just one homeowner during the tour part of the meeting. And by the way, I don't know if you noticed, but what I'm also doing is I'm trying to build a rapport at the same time. And had we had more time, I would have talked about um, you know, the Ford method, their family, um, their occupations, all of that. And I would have just started to develop a rapport with Jessica. But in any case, the second meeting where I, when I come back with the value, I want everybody who's on the deed or responsible for signing on that closing to be at that meeting. So Jessica, um, would it be okay if we come back tomorrow? I'm gonna to ask you for a couple of days, but would it be okay if we come back tomorrow at six? Does that yep. sound like something yep. that would work for you and your husband? Yep. Okay, that's great. Um, <laughs> and at that time, if you're happy with our market analysis and our marketing plan, will you be in a position where you'll be ready to sign listing paperwork? I will. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, that's great. I'll make sure I have it with me then for your review. Okay. Okay. So we'll come back and we'll talk more about this after we've done some research. Sounds good. Okay. So at that point, I would just have a little bit more conversation as I'm on my way out the door and um, I would let Jessica go. And we haven't taken up too much of her time, but we've gotten enough information where we can actually go and do some really great um, research. There's a couple of things that she said that we want to be sure of reviewing. She gave us, and I sent it all to you, um, photos and specs of what they've done. Um, so a scope of their work. And she told us that the old listing was on Zillow it's probably still on um, MLS as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we, um, the other, the other um, I don't know if the square footage is like 100% accurate just because we did change some stuff around, um, okay. but directionally, right? I, I don't, I'd have to look back at the public records even to see what it even says at this point. But, um, but yeah, that could be a little bit wonky, but I guess that's the only other thing, but it, you know, it's, it's there you know, yep. similar. And well, and we saw it, we physically came, we saw the house, we know what it looks like, we're going to be able to do a great market analysis now. Okay, great. Okay. All right. So um, the next part is just for the students, we'll talk about how we're going to move forward with that. 
And Jessica, what I'll do is if you'd like, I'll send out a whole nother invitation for the second appointment. And okay. we'll have um, one or two of them actually be presenting to you. Is okay. that okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we'll also, they'll also be completing, um, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people here. They'll be completing a written market analysis and we'll submit those to you. Okay, sounds good. Okay, thank you, Jessica, for the tour. No problem, thank you. All right, bye-bye. Right. Bye. So guys, what'd you think of that? Is that how you pictured a um, first meeting to be? Yeah, that was great. Super thorough, be able to see through the, the home and all the changes that she's made. So it's less important that we do that tour. Um, if we were, if she hadn't told me ahead of time that they had changed the house drastically since the last time it was on the market, it would be easier to do a one visit meeting if, if it was the same house that they bought. But it's really not the same house that they bought. And by the way, it was nice to see that their um, updates were very tastefully done, right? So that will help us. Um, it's almost like having a lot of the new, almost a new house in certain aspects, but yet the charm of having an old colonial home. So I think that that's gonna weigh in her favor very well. And I really wanted that outside tour so that I could see just how much those two lots were going to affect her property that she's going to be putting on the market. And I felt like it was very tastefully done. You could almost not, it, it almost didn't affect the property at all for uh, marketing purposes. Don't you feel? Yes. So. Um, do you guys have any questions about that? About any of that? Okay. So who wants to tell me what they think the next step is? Is, is to, the next step would be to sit and do an, uh, the CMA. Yeah, we're gonna do some fact gathering first though, right? Yeah, so you wanna you know, check public records and um, check the deed and, and those types of things to, to get information on the, on the house itself and yep. the people who own it before you start looking at other properties. So let me take you guys, um, I'm gonna share my screen with you. And I, I'm going to start taking you to through my process. Is that okay with all of you? Yep. And then, guys, when you come back to the next appointment, and, and we'll figure out how much time you think you need in order to create your market analysis. Um, and we can do an interim practice if you want to before we actually meet with the client, if that helps you. But um, let's get through this research phase of it and then we'll determine what, whether we need to meet together and alone without the client or whether we can go right to the market analysis appointment next. So the first thing that I normally do, and I wanna, I wanna look up the upgrades real quick one time. So I sent you all of this information and so somebody remember this address because I'll, I'll copy it here and hopefully, hopefully I won't lose it, but just in case I do. Okay, so she has sent us pretty much a little bit of scope of work here of everything that they've done. Um, and we're going to go and we're going to find the old listing. That's going to be our first order of business. Now, what I sent you was this and a lot of pictures and I think a floor plan so that you'll have all of that when you start um, recreating. Yeah, here's the floor plan right here. So 
So she's kind of just telling us what they were planning to do to this property um, as far as taking that portion off. So try to be pretty flexible with that. We're just looking at it as an attached one car garage and it's very small, 15 by 15. So I wouldn't give it a lot of credence when you're doing your market analysis. But here's the basic floor plan of the first floor. And then she's got the second floor here as well. That she's just kind of giving you kind of an idea of what we walked through. And nothing that you're going to use as gospel. But it's good to have, right? So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take us into MLS 10. And I'm going to show you what I, I would have already had this done because I mostly do first one, one visit appointments. And even if I were doing a two visit appointment, I wanna have as much information as I possibly can when I go. So I probably would have done all of this legwork before I went to that first appointment. And I would have sent them out a pre-listing package so that they could read over who the Scotland team is and what we're gonna to offer to do for them. And if they don't read it, that's okay, but that's all right. The fact that you sent one means you're more organized than 90% of the rest of the agents, okay? So, all right, here I am, and I'm gonna go to tools right now. And I wanna go to property history first. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to paste in that address and I'm gonna take the 985 it and move it over here. Okay, and then um, 01453 is Lemonster. So I'm going to search for that property, and what you'll see is we have it listed one time, and it was sold in April of 2019. So they haven't owned it for very long. We're coming up on two years. And let me just move this out of the way. It tells us that it was listed for 349.9 and it actually sold for 352.950. So those are things that I wanna know. And I wanna, I wanna take advantage of. Um, I also am going to open that listing, that old listing. And I'm really going to start paying attention to it. Really nice picture there. And remember, we're not going to have all of this over here. Um, so the things that I'm going to look at here are, let's see. And you can use this as a guide when you're filling out your listing forms. However, never, ever take somebody's, some other agent's word for the truth, right? Always do your own due diligence when you're, you're filling out your MLS packets and whatnot. You can use this as a, okay, this is what the last agent said about the property. What am I going to say? That kind of thing. And actually, they've got a pretty nice write-up here, which is lovely. And I'm not going to read it to you right now. I'm just going to tell you, this is what I do. I go through it. I want to see what the perspective of the other agent was. I want to look at all of this information and I want to see how it's changed. Um, that person went through the trouble of measuring every single room. What I want to tell you about measurements, if you're going to take measurements of the rooms, make sure that you put under, um, let's see, firm remarks and, and also under disclosures. I, I overkill it a little bit. Um, I always will say room sizes are for um, information only and should not be considered as accurate. I don't want anybody suing me later on because they didn't get a 15 by 17 living room. It's only 15 by 16 and a half. And also when I'm putting down my living area, I'm using the public record unless I have proof that it's changed somehow. Um, so she said that they've changed some of it. If they made it smaller, I might 
try to figure that out. Mostly I'm going to always use the, what the public record tells me. And then I'm going to say, I'm going to disclose right here again under living area disclosures. I'll say part of the living room, approximately 30 square feet of the living room has been removed or some such thing. Or maybe I might have to say the living area under living area disclosures that um, living area area square footage does not include the finished basement or some such thing like that. Okay. So always make sure that you make disclosures if you change, especially if you change anything that's on the public record. Or if you know that something's not on the public record that you are going to use. Okay. Okay. So um, here is where we can see this 2.93 acres. That clearly is going to be different. And it may not be different on the um, public record, which I'm going to show you in a few minutes, but we know it's different. So when we post this, we're going to find out exactly how much land they're leaving with the house. And that's what we're going to put here because we're not going to advertise it as 2.93 acres by any means. Um, we can see that those appliances in, were included before. We'll ask them what appliances they're going to include. And we'll get some more information. Like if they did a whole kitchen rehab, they may have replaced all those kitchen utilities, uh, I mean, appliances. And we're going to want to make sure that we make note, are they energy efficient, uh, energy rated, and are they stainless steel and that type of thing. Um, I, I also want to tell you, less is more when you're doing um, MLS sheets. And why do I say that? So if I get two, I would put circuit breakers and I might put 200 amps in here if I knew for a fact that that's what was there. But I'm not going to get too detail oriented and what that includes um, because I don't want to be held liable if I made a mistake. And I'm not an electrician. So I'm going to keep it pretty basic. I, I think it's important that they know it's been upgraded from fuses to circuit breakers. And I would have loved to have known if the knob and tube wiring had been replaced. And I will ask for that when I'm sitting with them the next time. But um, I'm going to keep that pretty general and let them and the home inspector tell them what exactly the wiring is all about. And some other things like that as well. I will put hot water in there and I will put the furnace and, and the type of oil, the type of heat it has in there, but I'm not gonna really um, get specific about any of that. Let them do that with their home inspector because they will hold you liable. And Judy, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, as far as like, all because, this is a house that they did a lot of work on. Like, do you ask questions to the building department to see if permits were? No, you ask them. You ask them, but you don't need to see that the permits were so signed I, off or what was done. I am gonna ask them if they got building permits for all of their work. I'm not gonna go, I personally am not gonna go and now, so, that's a tricky question because the more you investigate, the more you have to disclose. And it's not that I'm trying to hide anything, but if a seller tells me they got permits that I'm going and, and they got occupancy permits, mm -hmm. uh, occupancy certificates, then mm -hmm. I'm gonna take them at their word. And the buyer can certainly go to the town and look up what they have. So you're just going to ask them if they got permits for the work. That's it. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. And, you know, if they want to include um, the permits and the occupancy in their packet, I'm certainly happy to, to take it and to give it to a, a finalist. 
but I'm not going to go down to the, I'm not gonna go into the building department and try to search for problems. Okay. Well, I mean, like, you know how towns have property cards and sometimes those property cards have permits that were signed off. Do you go to the town and get any of that information or not? So you can look up the property card, which we're gonna to try to do here in a few minutes. Um, I, I very rarely go to the town hall physically, especially now with COVID. Um, okay, so we can see right here, and she already told us that it was private utilities, sewer and water, right? So because it was private sewer, we have to know, is it gonna pass Title V? Here's the rule for Title V. Title V inspections are good for two years, or three, if they can prove that they had it pumped annually since it, since the last one. So I'm gonna find out what's the date on the Title V that they have. Now this I would normally do at the first meeting because I'm only doing one meeting with them. Um, but in this case, since we were just doing a tour of the property, I'll ask them this at the second meeting, or I would normally, let's say. So I'm gonna say, when was your, I see that you so you bought the house in 2019 and um, you had a passing Title V then. What was the date of that? Do you have that handy? And if they have it, and then, and it's it's more than two years old, I will then say to them, if you've had the system pumped every year, and you have receipts for that, it can go three years. Otherwise, we're gonna to have to do a new Title V, and I would recommend doing that as soon as possible. And then they're gonna say, how much is a Title V inspection? A Title V inspection, I've seen them run anywhere from 800 to $2,000, depending on the time of year and what they have to do and how difficult it is to get to the things that they need to inspect. Um, okay, so if they have private water as well, I'll ask them questions about the well. So I see here that you have private water. Could you tell, you've already told me that you have two wells, one for the lawns, which is awesome by the way, and one for drinking. Do you know anything about that well? Have you had it tested? Did you have it tested when you moved in? Um, do you know how deep it is? Okay, and just as you're going through, what I would do as a new agent especially is I would go into MLS and you can print out the blank MLS form and make questions from it because you're gonna to need to know all those answers when you list the property. Um, okay, so let's see if there's anything that they, oh, that's another thing. You'll definitely need a lead paint disclosure on this property because it's built before 1978. And that it says there's a property condition statement. We'll pull that up and we'll look at it as well. Okay. And here are the pictures of the old listing. I mean, it looked pretty nice even back then, right? But you can see that they did do the big island here and they took the wallpaper down. And I don't know if they replaced any of those lights or not. And that upstairs bathroom. So they, they did do some updating. You can see just from the old pictures that they did that. Um, so then let's, let me show you what I would do next. So the next thing that I would do after I went through this, and by the way, I always print this out for myself just to use and just to have in my packet. Um, and sometimes I'll even add it to my listing presentation. So when I do a listing presentation, I'm going to take most of the stuff I already sent them in my pre-listing package is gonna be part of my listing presentation. 
then I'm going to put the market analysis in there. And then I'm going to put some other supporting information, like maybe I might put this in here, in there. And I'm going to bind it and put it behind um, plastic so that it looks almost like a, a bound little book. And I'm going to go through it with them. And believe me when I tell you that people think you've spent a lot of time and done a lot of work. And you're very well prepared when you create a presentation like that. Um, so, okay, let me go into, do you see up here, all of these things up here are interesting. And I'm just trying to see what that is. Best view image, that might be a virtual tour. You can see, I also have a place where I can go and do a mortgage calculator for this listing. And you can do that for, like say we listed this price, this property for 475. And we're gonna get around 3% for interest right now. And we're gonna leave it at 30 years. And we can see that the taxes are all in here as well, um, 56.23 per year. So we're gonna calculate that. And the monthly payment's gonna come out at 24.71. That was with, I need to see how much that was with down. Oops, sorry. Let's go back there. So I can put different percentages down here. Like I can do, um, 3.5% down and calculate it out. And the payment would be 2401. Or I can go back. Where is that? And put in different down payments. Like say I, I wanted to put 20% down. I could go back and calculate that out as well. And so I might, I might print it out just at a 20% just to show people that might be in my my book that I lead. So I always, once I have a listing, I always create a little book for the property so that agents bringing their people there can see all of these kind of things. Um, but they're not gonna take the book away from the property. It's just gonna stay at the property. So I might do that for the property as well. And I'm gonna look on here and see if there's that piece of paper with a paper clip. That means there's an attachment. There should have been an attachment here because they said the property condition statement was attached. It's not here, which means MLS could have just removed the attachments. I don't know. Um, right here is the public record for the property. And I'm gonna click on that and I'm always gonna print this out too because this gives me a lot of information. For example, it tells me that um, this is being held in a trust. So I'm gonna wanna see, I'm gonna wanna ask them for their trust paperwork because that's gonna matter as to what the name is that I'm gonna list it under and who has to sign. Do they both have to sign? Well, uh, that, the trust paperwork will tell me usually who has to sign, um, what the name of the owner is, and so on and so forth. So that was interesting right off, the, right off the bat. I can also look right here and I can see the map and the book for um, the plot plan. Um, it's a one family residence per the town. This is what the town says about the property. It's a one family residence with two levels. It was built in 1784 and has 10 rooms, four bedrooms and two and a half baths. Now I'm gonna go, I've already been through the property. So I'm gonna be like, okay, does that match what I saw? I always wanna know that. They're also saying that we've got forced hot water by oil. And I know that there's an additional system in there. So I'm gonna make note of that, right? And we know it has air conditioning. So we're gonna also make note of that as well. Um, and it's listed as an antique, which we know is true. Then we're gonna go down a little bit further on this 
form on this paperwork. And they're gonna see, again, they're telling us that it closed in May of 2019. And I, don't, I think it was April of 2019 on our, our in the other place that we saw it, but we'll see on the deed as well when we pull the deed up. And the sale price was $352,950. Um, we've got the book and page here. So let's write that down so that we can look that up. Although, like I said, I would be printing this sheet out if I were actually doing my, my due diligence. So um, 9324 is our book and page is 350. So when we go to the registry of deeds, that's what we're going to be looking for. Um, it's valued right now in the town at 334.7. So what does that mean? Does that mean the house is only worth that? Anybody want to take a take a gander on that? Anybody? Anybody? What do you think about assessments? Well, I know, like for my town, um, just you don't assess property every single year based on market conditions because because it costs money to to uh, reassess all the property in the town and they have to hire somebody to do it. So they sometimes they fluctuate the tax rate to adjust for market conditions, but keep the valuation the same. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily the fair market value. It's not based on market conditions. Correct. That's true. And, and it very rarely is fair market value, quite frankly. So don't put too much credence in that. And when the buyers, if you're working with a buyer and they say, but it's only assessed at, assessments are not fair market value. Very rarely do they match. Um, but anyway, we can see that um, Jeremy Pierce was the buyer and Mark Peralt was the seller. Um, and, and so on and so forth. So that's good information that we got there. So the next thing that I do, and I may be a little bit overkill, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I wanna go, Here. And I want to look up the registry of deeds. And so first thing I want to do, let's pretend we don't know what, what county is Lemonster Mass in, right? Because we may have listings all over the state. So we need to know that. Um, so we know here that it's in Worcester County. And so now let's go and type in Worcester County Registry of Deeds. Now I'm going to get to Worcester County Registry of Deeds and I'm going to go and search records, search our records. Okay, now I like to do I like to do a book search. That's my favorite way to do it because I just wrote the book down. So it's 93, 24, and page 350. And then I'm gonna search. Now I have zero criteria. Why do you think that could be? Maybe when they put it in the trust, they recorded it again on a different number. Possibly, yep. How about this? You see this? Whoa, what is that? What is that showing me right here? All the towns that are in Worcester County registered in yeah. And Lemonster's not there. What do you think that means? Anybody? More than one. So is it broken up? Worcester County has two 
registry of deeds, or at least that I know of. Um, so what we should have done is we should have gone to Worcester North. Of deeds. Oh, so I did that to show you that don't get blocked when you found that you couldn't find that book and page number in there. You gotta, you gotta be thinking, right? Why, why didn't that show up? What, what did I do wrong? And so, Worcester County North is its own registry of deeds, and. We're going to go in here and see. We're going to do the same thing in here. And we are going to search by name or address. And when we get in here, we can push book and page. So we'll put that book and page in here again. This is 9324 and page 350. And then we're going to search. Oh, this time we have something. So let's look and see what does that look like? Okay, so here's my D. I'm going to, I'm always going to either print this or save it, whichever I, I try to be paperless. So every time I'm telling you I print this, usually what I'm really doing is I'm saving it in my, um, my Dropbox folder. That I, and I've in my Dropbox folder, I've got um, a folder for every seller and every buyer. And it starts off by breaking them up into buyer or seller, and then it's active, um, prospect, or closed. And when I get into the correct folder, what I will do is I'll name it by the address or the buyer's last name if I'm working with a buyer. And then I'm gonna put in, if I'm working with a listing, I'm going to make a folder inside of the address folder that says listing documents, photos, and purchase documents. And so everything's always organized and I always know where to find stuff. And I don't have it all over my desktop simply because it's so hard to find when you've got 4,000 different folders all over your desktop. Plus it takes up memory. What was the last one? Listing documents, photos, and what? Purchase documents. Perfect. So I'm gonna look at this and I'm gonna see, let's see, grants to Jeremy Pierce and Jessica Pierce, husband and wife. Hmm, that's funny, there's no trust listed here. So I'm not gonna drag you through this, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you, do an address search next. You're saving this one. And by the way, we just confirmed that the closing was on 5-20-2019, right? So what I would do after this, knowing that there was a trust document somewhere is I would look up the property by address and I would just go in and see what I could find and see if I could find where it's changed from the husband and wife to their trust so that I know how I'm going to list the property and what I'm going to list it as in my exclusive right to sell. Okay. But I'm not going to do that now because it's just going to take too much time. Um, easy enough to do though, right? Okay. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Lemonster Mass EIS. Oops. You see that? Pardon me? I was going to say that that deed said 39 acres. Yeah, so that was probably what it originally started off as, and they've kept plucking away at it, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so now I'm going to go to Lemonster GIS, and I'm going to type in the address. Does anybody remember? Was it 930? Um, Pleasant Street. Anybody remember? 
and look, look what came up. Now I've got the math, right? And I know that math is going to change. And she actually told me if I heard her correctly, that the driveway is going to go over here somewhere, right? To get to these other two lots. So that's pretty cool that I have this here to look at. But look what else I can get. If you look over here, I can get that property card. I can get the Google map, all kinds of different things, right? So this is something that I always want to do as well. And I'll save that into my Dropbox file. And what I may do is I may print it all up and put it as part of my listing presentation. Just so she knows. I've done my research, I know what your property is, and I've spent a lot of time figuring this all out. Okay, does that make sense? So now I want to go back, let's see if I can get this out of the way. There we go. I want to go back, now that I've got all this stuff, and I'm going to show you another thing that I like to do. And I don't want to confuse myself as well as you guys with all these different tabs open. I'm going to go back in here. And there's another thing that I love to do when I'm when I'm getting ready to go to a listing presentation. I'm going to do my own CMA and I'm going to show you guys how to do that in a second. But before I do that, I'm also going to go to tools again. And I'm going to go to RPR. Have any of you used RPR? Okay, so the first time that you're going to use it, you're not going to get this sign in because see it says welcome back. You're going to have to create a login for yourselves and you're going to need your NRDS number, which right under where it says it'll say right here NRDS number and then it'll say show me how to find my NRDS number. And you click on that and it'll bring you in and, and show you your NRDS number. And that's how you log in the first time. But let's pretend you've already done that. And I also want to tell you, whenever you're doing any of these things for the first time, go in and create your profiles. Because that's going to matter when you start printing reports and whatnot out. Okay? So, for example, um, let's see. Oh, not there. Oh, there it is. You're always going to want to look for your picture. Whenever you look for your picture, there should be a place you can go in and fill out your profile. And when I filled out my profile, it allowed me to put a photo in here and my logo in here. And I could put all this information in here as well. So that's going to be important for you because you're going to want to print out reports from here. And when you print out the reports, it's going to personalize it from you. Okay? See, this is my NRDS ID number. And so you'll all have one. As soon as you joined the, the Board of Realtors, you became a member of the Massachusetts Association of Realtors and the NASA National Association of Realtors. And so you will, you will have one of these numbers. So go in and set up your profile and then click save. And then I'm going to go back home. So, and right here, I'm going to put that address again, 985, you guys. Mm -hmm. Pleasant, right? Mm -hmm. When I do that, this is going to be kind of like a, a Zillow report. You guys have all been to Zillow, I'm sure. And only it's a little bit more accurate than Zillow is, traditionally speaking. And look, I can go in here and I'm going to see all the pictures again. Um, they've got it valued at 421680 What they don't know that we know are a couple of things. Number one. The location of this property is, is lovely. Number two, 
they've done a lot of updates that aren't reported in here. Okay. Um, so that's okay. And what we want to do, we can create a CMA here, or we can just go right in here and use it as we will. So for example, now that I've pulled this up, I can go to reports and I want you to go and just look at the, the different reports and decide if you want to add any of these to your listing presentation. And by the way, I leave that listing book with them unless I think that they're going to give it to some other realtor so that they can copy. <laughs> I will leave that report with them. And so they don't have to look at all this stuff while I'm there, but they're going to think it's really cool that you've got a school report or a neighborhood report or market activity report, but go in and look at the different reports and decide which ones you wanna use and use it to kind of just um, gut check yourself when you're doing a CMA. Um, also, you can pick when you're doing, I'm gonna show you a sample of this one just quickly. When you are doing a market analysis, or uh, one of these reports, you can pick which stuff you want to show and which stuff you don't. And so it's going to it's going to show you the whole whole report. Get it to there we go. Anyway, this is eighty one pages. It's going to show you what the property history of the value has been, and you can get all different kinds of statistics in here. And if you're an analysis kind of person and you can talk um, intelligently to these graphs and reports that it gives you, print them up, use them in your presentation if you think you need it. What I wanna teach you about a listing presentation most of, most of all though is if they've said they're ready to sign with you, stop talking. Don't blow it. If, if they, they're like, okay, we're ready, let's go. Okay, I'm gonna leave this book with you. Let's do the documentation next. We won't even talk about any of that. We'll just fill out the paperwork. Don't say too much. If you need to keep building your case that you're the best person for this job, then talk. Ask questions mostly, because questions are gonna be what's gonna help you to get to know them and make them feel like you care. But as soon as you know they're gonna sign that listing paperwork with you, stop talking. Don't present any more stuff to them. Just leave it with them. And always when you go to, the, if you're gonna do a one listing visit or a two listing visit, whichever one you're going to do, make sure when you do the listing presentation at either your one visit or the second visit of your two visit presentation, Make sure you have all your listing paperwork with you so that when they say, yeah, I'm ready to go, let's do this. Or they might say something like, yeah, I'd love to list with you and I'm planning to, but I, I need two more weeks to get the house in order. Oh, that's no problem. Don't worry about it. We'll do a deferral of showings and a delayed entry. That's all part of the paperwork. We can put it on the market whenever you say. And if we do the paperwork now, when you're ready, all we have to do is push the button and launch it on MLS. And by the way, that's great that you need two weeks because that'll give me time to plan, to do my marketing plan and get the stager out there and have professional photography done for you or whatever you're gonna do for them. Okay, so here's our PR and go in there and look at it and decide if you like it, use it. If you don't, that's okay but at least use it as a gut check. You know, you know that the property is probably worth at least what it says in here. So it said what, 324 something, okay? So the next thing that I'm gonna do when I'm doing my listing presentations, I'm just gonna go back this way, is I like to do my market analysis the old school way. So what I normally do is I come in here and I search and I select single family and I want all the way there. 
but I also want to see withdrawn, expired, and canceled and coming soon. I just don't care about rentals. I don't want to see that. And I do want to see contingents. So I'm usually going to check those. And um, I know I'm going to do Lemonster, right? Even though she said it's right on the Princeton line and it was a blah, 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 blah. The appraiser's not going to go over the line and use the Sterling property to do the market analysis. So I'm going to try to stay in Lemonster if I can. But what I might do is I might go and, I, and by the way, I might come over here and I might say, um, plus or greater than two or whatever the case may be. And I might do two plus, but I'm probably not because I know myself that I love to get to know the market that I'm in. And so I'm probably not going to do that. Um, I could also put Pleasant Street in here and do a radius of five miles maybe if I chose to, but right now I'm just not going to do that. And the other thing that I could do is I could go in here and put in additional information, right? Like if it was a ranch, I could go down into to, um, style and I could choose ranches. For this purposes, let's go to style. No, that wasn't what I wanted. Sorry, guys. I clicked when I shouldn't have. Style. And you see right here, now I can go in and I can click antique right here. So it's only going to show me antiques in Lemonster. I think I'll do that. I'm not going to. I'm not going to stick any of the other criteria in here because honestly, what I love to do is I love to see all of the information. I love to look at all of it and then select the listings that I choose. Um, and I'm going to show you a couple different ways to do a market analysis, but this is how I always start. So then I'm going to search. I know I've got six results here. And oh, look at this one on Central Street. Almost looks like the same house, doesn't it? Let's hope it doesn't look like the same house inside though, because that only sold in November for 399. So what I would do is I would go through every one of these listings. I'd look it up, I'd read all about it. And then I'd come down here and just go through all the pictures. Hmm, looks pretty nice. That's, that's um, a little scary to me, even though, and it's even got that same room out there. Um, so this is on Central Street. And I'm going to really try to pinpoint where that is because I'm hoping that that's not a good comp for me because I know she wants 450. So I don't want to comp it with something that's $150,000 less if I don't have to. And so, um, I just want to see if I can see where that is exactly. Okay, so that's way out by Willard Street. And, and of course, Central Street's a pretty busy street, but so is Pleasant Street. Yeah, that's right at the intersection there. And that's pretty bad. So I'm going to say, okay, this is not going to be a good comp for me. thankfully, right? And I'm gonna do that to all six of these, but six, geez, I was hoping I'd have more than six to look at. And these are all in the twos and threes. So now I gotta go back and I gotta do some difference. I gotta do something different. So I'm gonna take this off of here. And I'm gonna just go back here and I'm gonna put 500 
or maybe even 550 and 400 defenses. I'm going to, I'm just going to search Lemonster in that range and see what I come up with there. So I've got 61 results now, and that's a lot better. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through them and I'm going to open them just like I just did. And I'm going to look at them. And I know right now I could go through real quick and I can eliminate that. I can eliminate that. And I could probably eliminate that because it's new. You know, I'm just going to go through here and I'm going to um, delete all those properties that I know are not even close. And I'm going to narrow it down. My goal to do a market analysis properly is that I want to have three active listings, a minimum of guys, three active listings, three contingent or under agreement listings. And by the way, MLS counts contingent as still active. So when they're doing the separating for you, I think they put contingent properties in with actives, but I want three under agreements and three solds. So there are nine, a minimum of nine listings if I can find them, right? And once I find them, I can see this little button right here that says cloud CMA. I can click on that and I can go and it's going to create this market analysis with the listings that I chose as my comps. That's the hard way to do it. That's the way I do it because I'm old school and I like to get to know my um, locations, especially if I'm not real comfortable with them by doing it the old hard way. That being said, instead of doing that, you could do this. You could go right into Cloud CMA. I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna teach you how to do that, sorry. You could go right to the tools section again. And you could click on this Cloud CMA button, or you could go right up here on this toolbar, this handy dandy toolbar, and you could click tool, Cloud CMA, okay? So I'm gonna click Cloud CMA. And I'm going to click create a new report and I'm going to go into CMA. And I'm going to put my client's name down. So it's, what was it, Jeff? What was her name? Jessica? No. Oh, we'll just say Pierce for now. I'm having a mental block, sorry. <laughs> now I can write anything I want in here and it's not going to show up. So if I think I need to, Say I'm doing four or five different market analysis. I can write myself notes that will remind me which house this was. Whereas you're doing one market analysis and you don't have any others, you probably don't even care about that. But feel free to write yourself notes if you think um, like uh, part of the barn is being torn off. Um, so then I'm going to go in here and I'm going to fill out 985 Pleasant Street, Lemonster. And look what happens. Now, if I had photos, I could go and get those photos. I can't get, I don't think I can get to mine because mine are on Dropbox. And for some reason, I can't get into Dropbox from here. But I could put a photo here. Uh, because we have photos. So practice that, guys. If you have to, and you can, if, if you are using Dropbox, I don't know if you have access to get to them from here. If you don't, put it on your desktop and go and pick it up from desktop. Um, but add a photo, add a cover photo. Um, it's residential. And I don't see anything else that I think we need to put in here under the subcategory. Now there's two different things I can do. If I had gone and chosen some listings, I could put the MLS numbers in here as well as clicking on CMA from the listing page, the search page. Um, or I could say automatically find listings near the subject property, get me at least 10, only go back one year, or I could say six months, uh, if I can, 
I'm going to try to make sure my, my listings are within six months. The market is rising so fast right now that really six months is about all I want to go back if I can help it. And I can add more criteria here if I wanted to. But for the sake of teaching you guys that, um, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to hit the fetch listings. And by the way, here's another picture of myself, right? I'm, I need to go in and I need to set up, make sure my profile is set up in here as well. Okay. So right now it's thinking. Hopefully it thinks a little faster than that. So now look, this is interesting because I'm all over the place, aren't I? It should show me the subject property, but um, right this second, I can't quite see it. Does anybody see it? Oh, here it is. There we go. Wow. Ah. So this, see this blue um, thing right here? That's my, my subject property. So when I'm looking at other properties, I'm kind of wondering why are these grayed out? Because that's a nice listing. This is for sale. It should give us the I don't know what these are, these gray ones. This is something that we'll have to research. If anybody knows, feel free to hang, to raise your hand and tell me. But in any case, if I look at the key over here, the green ones are active, the orange ones are under contract and the red ones are sold. So I know my properties here and I, I bet you I'd like to use this. There's not a lot that have sold unless these gray things, I don't know what they mean, but boy, we're, we're not doing very well here for finding good comps. In any case, it's, it's going from like 320, Oh, these are closed. I wonder why it's not showing us these. I don't see this. Why are they listed here? But I wonder if maybe it's because we did six months and it went back before that. Yep. So use a, you might have to use a year in this one because it just so happened, and, and there may be no rhyme or reason to it, that no higher end properties have sold within the last six months. So let's go back a step into criteria. This is what you do. I mean, I'm teaching you what I do. This is what you do. You, you play it and you go back and you, you reevaluate. And so I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna change this back to 12 months and see if that changes what we get for listings and prices too. You gotta think in this business and you always have to be, why is this working like that? And why aren't we showing these? And how come there's no listings that match? And now we've got some higher price listings and we don't have any grayed out anymore. So that worked well. And so what I can now do is I can do the same thing. I can either go, go right in here and I can say, okay, here's my property. And they've got it evaluated by all the properties on the market. They're telling me it's gonna comp out at 500K. So I know I don't need this one because that's definitely not gonna comp, be a comp for it. So I just took it right out of there. And I can just go through that and keep doing that. To all the properties that I don't think are gonna match. And after I do that, now it's gonna, it's gonna keep redoing this. You might have to refresh a couple of times, but it's gonna change this. And you're gonna be able to see my average, my median, and my high, right? And then you can come up here 
and you can put in the number that you want. So say I wanted it to be seven, 475. And let's look down here and, you know, we can take off this one because it's way too low. And you get in the picture of what I'm, what I'm doing. I definitely think these are going to be good to you. Um, and I certainly. Would it help to put like the square feet in so you can eliminate all these like much smaller places? You can, but as I said before, I like to look at them all and then, and then um, eliminate just because I'm getting to know the area as well at the same time. But if you want to put some criteria in there, again, feel free to do that. Absolutely. Um, and square footage is, is a place that's going to help you to not see some of those lower end properties. Okay, so say that I'm done here. Now I go to customize report. And now I have to go in at least the first time and I have to decide what my layout's gonna look like. So you're gonna take your CMA report and you're gonna go through all these up here and decide. I've used the modern red and black theme. You can use whatever you want. You can go in here. That didn't show me anything. Oh, oh because I went in the wrong place. But see, there's all different things that you can use. And you can choose whatever you want. And then if I were you guys, this is your first time. So this first market analysis is going to take much longer than any of the rest of them because you're going to go in here and you're going to set your defaults, right? And I'm going to look at, the, see this eyeball right here? I'm going to go in and say, what does this title page look like? Do I want to use it? Oh, yeah, I like that. I'm going to use that. And I'm going to go right down this whole thing. And I don't use any of these agent resumes or about my company or any of that because I also put my listing presentation, which has all of that in it, in the package. So I don't need it to be part of my market analysis. But I definitely want to keep that in here. I, I, I do keep this one in here. I definitely want a map of all the listings and a summary of these, but you know, I, I mean, I'm probably gonna take out our company, the agent resume, the cover letter, I'm gonna leave the title page and so on and so forth. But go through here and, and look at all of them. This moving checklist, do I wanna keep that in there or do I already have something like that in my listing package? Judy, if you fill out your profile, will it pull all of that information and put it in there automatically for you? Or do yes. you have to set that up? Okay. Yep. So let's, let's see. Um, contact me, for example. See how I filled out my profile and now it's got my face and my logo and my address and all my contact information in here. So yeah, it's important to fill out your your um, profiles everywhere. And don't forget MLS pin when you first log in there. Um, you're gonna wanna fill it out in there too, because when you start pulling up listings for buyers, you can set it so that your header and footer is all of your contact information. And you just push the type of printout you want and your profile automatically populates all the information. So that's it in a nutshell. And I'm gonna let you guys all do your market analysis. How, how long do you guys think you need for, for your market analysis? And do any of you have any questions as well? Okay, I need you guys to talk. <laughs> so you, you said 475, but how no, would we know? I was just, pulling up a number that I thought might be good somewhere in there. So do you I, didn't, with what? I haven't done enough research to, to say 475. That was just an example of what I could say. Okay, so could do you think you like start with what, what if they tell you what they want, you could start with that? 
and then see if prove it's true? So what or I you... did is honestly, I started a little higher than what she wanted just so I, I could know. see how realistic she was, right? And I also went a little lower than what she wanted. I don't remember what I pulled. I think I might've gone 400 to 475 maybe. Yeah. Yeah, because somewhere in that range, I knew what it sold for. And I know it's been a couple of years and I know the market is rising dramatically. In fact, in some places it went up 17% last year. So I, I wanted to, I kind of just mentally did the math real quick, just to, just to give myself a range. And when I put that 475 into the market analysis number, like list, we recommend you list your house at this number, that, that was just me throwing a number out there. That could have been any number. So don't take that as my gospel or what I think that house is worth. I have a question. Yeah. Um, when you did that, it said that it, it put it at 500,000. Okay. Now, are you, you're not presenting that to the seller? Nope. So, okay. So I just was wondering what the seller's seeing. Cause I know I didn't follow all of what you just so did. see the map if you include the map and I'm, I'd have to look and I want you guys to look and see if they put a number on that subject property on that map. And if they do and it's too high, you may not want to use that. You may want to eliminate the map from your report. Okay. Okay. But if they're just pinpointing it, or you could just explain it away too. Because RPR didn't give it a $500,000 um, value. So you could just say, you know, they're saying that it's going to be worth somewhere in, in the 500 range based on the information that we found, this is where we believe the price should be. What do you think? And if you really get a sticky seller that says, my house is worth 500,000, I know it is, then what I want you to do is I want you to take every comp that you used and say it's, say you've got 475 for a price and they want 500,000. And I want you to pull up those comps and I want you to go through them. Okay, let's look at this house compared to your house. Do you feel that if you were in the market right now and both houses were listed at the same price, which one would you buy? Would you buy your house or would you buy this, part, this house? Okay, well, no, you wouldn't buy this house. You think your house is better. Okay, then, then you believe that the value is higher than X, whatever that price was that you're using as that comp. Do you get what I'm saying? So if you get somebody that's, I don't very rarely, <coughs> excuse me. Excuse me again. I very rarely have to do that. Usually by the time I've gotten through showing them the, the comps for their house and building a rapport with them, <coughs> And letting them see that I'm the professional and I've done my homework and I know what I'm doing. Very rarely do they ever question the value. But if they do, I'm like, okay, I wanna sit down and I want you to help me find, determine why you think the house is worth 500 because maybe I'm not seeing something. So let's go through every listing together. This house has granite and yours has vinyl. This house has all hardwood floors and yours has carpeting, you know, and we go through that with them. Or your house has hardwood and this house has carpeting and your house has um, updated kitchen and bathrooms and um, granite and this house hasn't been touched since the 80s. Yours is clearly worth more than this and this sold for X, right? So now we know it's worth at least that much and probably more. So let's find another house that we used as a comp and, and let's look at the details and determine why it sold for what it did and how yours compares with that. And I would just go through them one by one. If, if I had a tough client that didn't just buy into 
my experience and my recommendations. And how much wiggle room would you give a client? So if you say you think it's valued at say 445 and they want to list it at 460. So, I mean, every one of us is going to have a different answer to that question. And every agent you ask is going to have a different answer to that question. I always want it to be reasonable and more than having the price be reasonable, I want to know why. Why do they, because some of them, it has nothing to do with what they think the value is. It just has to do with the number they need to buy their next house. And I need to ed then educate them as to why that doesn't matter. And I need to find out if they're motivated or not motivated. Sometimes I'll take an overpriced listing as long as I know they're motivated enough to lower the price if it's not going to sell and what I do if I'm going to do that is I'm going to say hey listen you know what I don't have a crystal ball and I've done my homework and I believe the value is x but if you think it's y I'm willing to give that a try are you willing to lower the price in two weeks if it doesn't work out yeah, sure. Absolutely. I want to sell the house. I'm motivated. I'm, I, I've already got my house built. I'm, I'm moving. I have to sell it. I just want to make sure I'm not leaving any money on the table. Okay, well, then let's market it. So the average marketing time in Lemonster right now is 30 days. I'm guessing, right? So let's market it for two weeks. And um, at the end of two weeks, if we haven't got gotten any offers, we're gonna to need to reduce the price. Would you be willing to do that? If they say yes, then I'm gonna say, okay, well, what do you think would be fair? Do you think we should go down by 10%? Do you think we should drop it by 5,000, 10,000? Whatever the case may be, wherever I wanna get them to myself, I'm gonna do it in increments, but I'm gonna I'm gonna write it right into the listing. Seller agrees that on such and such a date, if they haven't accepted an offer, price will automatically be reduced to X. And that way I'm sure that it, they're motivated at least. And what I'm gonna make sure they know though is you only have one chance to make a first impression. And so if we list it too high, we're gonna lose that, oh boy, there's a new listing on the market time. And so you can never get that back again. If you're willing to gamble on that, I'm willing to as well, as long as we have a plan for if your number doesn't work. <clears throat> Mostly I never have to get there with people because by the time I've gotten done with my market analysis and we've looked at the listings together, they pretty much will say to me, oh, okay, wow, that house is a little nicer than mine and that house is not as nice. So I know it's somewhere between here and here. What do you think about this? And they mostly will come up with that number all by themselves. I don't even have to really fight for it. Does that help? All right, so who thinks they can go do this market analysis now? You guys think you have the, the tools you need now? Okay, so today's Monday. If I have a check-in with you on Wednesday, would that give you enough time to do your preliminary market analysis? And then if we, if we tell um, Jessica that we're gonna meet with her on Thursday, <clears throat> um, would that be time enough for you guys? Okay. So Wednesday, what time's good for everybody? One to one o'clock again? Yeah? Okay. So I'll plan a, a Zoom, another Zoom meeting for Wednesday at 1 p.m. And you guys can show me what you have at that point. And then how about Thursday at one? Is there any um, any classes online that you guys see that you're that will conflict with those that time? <clears throat> you're good. You good? Done at twelve. 
Okay. Are you are you doing ignite? Yeah. Yeah. Did you go today? Yeah. How'd you like it? It's great. It's really oh. motivating. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. So any of you guys who haven't gone today, think about it if you haven't already done it. Um, but okay, so I'm going to say Wednesday at 1 p.m. and Thursday at 1 p.m. to present. Okay. Perfect. And if you have any questions in the meantime, don't be afraid to reach out to me. But I think we've given you, I think I've given you a lot of tools to be able to do it. And so it's going to be great practice and great fun. I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. All right. Judy, anybody, will you be posting this video? Yes. Do you have a problem with that? No, I want it before Wednesday so I can review it. Oh, yes, absolutely. I am going to post this to my YouTube page um, probably this afternoon. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, you guys, if you have any more questions, um, reach out to me and it's been fun and I can't wait to get to the end of it. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.